Well, 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 welcome, friends, to the case for change. If you are a language lover, if you are a language teacher, and you want to see people fall in love with language the way that you did, then you are in the right place. This is the case for change, what research reveals needs to change in world language class. If you don't know me, my name's Devin Gunning. I'm also known as La Libre, and I gave this presentation to other teachers in my school, as well as my district at a PD seminar, because I just kept getting the same questions over and over again about why I was spending so much time creating proficiency-based resources instead of the stuff the district was providing me. Why do you keep doing all this stuff? Why do you teach with songs? Why are you not teaching this grammar concept that we're doing right now? People were interested in what I was doing and I needed a way to explain to them why it's urgent that we change the way that we teach language in our classrooms. This is stuff that I picked up while working on my master's in second language acquisition and teaching languages and I think it's a really huge problem in our field that the research is either too heavy or not readily available to the people who are using it every day in the field. This cannot stay in the ivory tower, people. This stuff is too good. So let's jump right in so that you can see what exactly the case for change is all about. This is going to be divided into three parts so that you have some time to digest it think about it, roll with it, check the references, and all of that good, good. Parte uno, number one, is going to be introduction. We're going to talk about linguistics and SLA research, what on earth second language acquisition is. The next section of part one is we're going to look at the role of grammar, everybody's favorite word, and input in instruction. Maybe you've heard of the term comprehensible input. Maybe somebody in your school uses it. Maybe you've been using it for a while, but you'd love to see what the research is. However you're coming to this, you're going to see a lot in here about what role grammar has in language acquisition. Part two, which is going to be the video after this one, we're going to talk about and dive deep into something really cool that I wish more people knew about called the orders of acquisition. We're also going to look at more themes. Hello, linguistic friends. We're going to look at more theme studies and English as both an L1 and an L2. And what that is going to mean for the Spanish orders of acquisition from both the L1 and the L2 perspective. The 4M model is a specific research that, study that we're going to take a look at and then some other models as well. And do not worry, other language friends who are not Spanish, don't worry, I have not forgotten you. I also teach French, so I feel you. Part three is going to be our exciting conclusion in which we look at curriculum implications, looking at the things that we learn in here, what is this going to mean for us? We're going to look at a really, really powerful article called The Case for a Realistic Beginning Level Syllabus, something published in AFL in 2012. And we're going to get to some cool conclusions for the language classroom. And I'm going to focus specifically on assessments and expectations. Let's jump in. The first thing that we're going to look at here is our purpose. Our purpose here is to apply research to update both our classroom practice and our curricula to ensure communicative language learning and program retention. So you can either do this with your dog, with your mirror, or if you're watching this with other teachers, with other teachers, but this is what I presented to my teachers here. So I want you to take a look at this too. Describe to the people around you how you learn to drive. What did you do? Who taught you? What did they teach you? When did you feel like you were a good driver? And the reason I'm asking you this is because we need to start looking at language less as an academic subject and more as a skill. Because honestly, before you ever learned your second language, if you are a non-native speaker like me, you learned it probably from a classroom environment or maybe a study abroad experience or travel experience, however you're coming to this field, language is something that you use. It is not something that lives in a book. It's something that you use. So I want you to look at this from the perspective of skill sets. And one of the most relatable skill sets that we have here is driving. 
and you're going to see this throughout. So think about what you remembered about learning how to drive. Let's take a look at some terms here. Second language acquisition. Over here, you're going to see on the left, this is the official definition. It is the internalization of the linguistic system. It's natural, it's unconscious, and it's a process that occurs without instruction in all humans. A lot of people look at it as birds learning to fly. It's an innate feature of human intelligence. Linguistics is the scientific study of language. Paula, and my language majors, you know exactly what linguistics is. You probably had to take a course in it. Now, here's an important thing that we need to look at here. This is language learning. Language learning is the process of gaining conscious knowledge of language through instruction. And that could be in a lot of different modes. Most of us here are coming from a K through 12 or a college background. Proficiency. This is what a learner can do with the language. So taking whatever they learned and putting it to use. There are four different modes. You've got reading, writing, speaking, and listening. And those are going to activate different parts of your brain. Here are some important implications, though. Look at the definition of acquisition and the definition of language learning. What does acquisition lead to? Negotiation of meaning. Learning leads to explicit knowledge of language features. So do not mistake this for being able to use those language features because it's actually quite separate and it's housed in different areas of the brain and it incorporates different skill sets as well. Looking at what we just learned here, We all, by a certain age, know how to drive. How much, right now, do you know about your engine? So you might be somebody who really does tinker on engines a lot, and you know a lot. Or you might be somebody like me, who will drop it off at the dealership and not even think twice about it. Is it important to understand how an engine operates? Does it make you a better driver? And can you drive effectively without knowledge of your engine? If you're kind of lost here, some common responses that I got from this question is that, yes, understanding your engine means that you'll be able to work it better. You'll be able to manipulate it better in certain situations and especially to help prevent you from running into danger. Absolutely true. But I will tell you that when asking a room full of drivers, there were only probably a handful of hands that went up for saying that they understood how an engine operates. Let's take a look at our good friend Stephen Krashen for language acquisition and a quote that he has here. Krashen made a distinction between learning and acquisition. To acquire a third person S, for example, we're thinking in English here, learners would need to hear lots of third person verbs in context as part of the communication of information. Acquisition happens because of exposure to input, not because anyone teaches the learner a rule or because he or she practices it. Unlike learning, acquisition for an L2 learner results in an implicit, unconscious linguistic system, just as it would for an L1 learner. Now this came from key terms in second language acquisition from Van Patten and Benani in 2010. Now, based off of that quote, describe to the people around you, or your mirror, or your dog, how you learned your language. Now for me, the very first language that I learned, I was actually three, and my family was stationed in Japan. So the first second language I actually had was Japanese. Unfortunately, I speak absolutely none of it now, which makes me real sad because I was very, very young and I didn't use it when I came back to the States. But my first experience learning a language was not in a classroom. It was in an immersion environment. And then the next language I learned was in seventh grade, learning French class. And then in college, learning Spanish. 
And then some of my non-class experiences was studying abroad for both of those languages. But I can tell you that it wasn't until several years after studying both of those languages and really being stuck in an immersion environment, specifically in Spanish, that I really started to feel proficient. Proficient for me being, of course, it, it depends on exactly what the task is, as we all know, as language teachers. What can I do with this language? And I started to get this gut feeling that even though I was able to describe a lot of what I needed to be able to do in a language, it wasn't until I was in the situation using it that I really started to feel proficient and ready to teach it. And maybe your experience was the same, maybe it's different, I don't know. Put in the comments below, share. Let's take a look at what my friend Bill Van Patten says here. I wish he was my friend. This guy is awesome. He knows a lot of stuff, and he's really done a lot for the field of world language. And if you do not listen to his podcast, get on it, people. I'll put it in the show notes below. But it's called Talking L2 with BVP, and then the older one is T with BVP. Legendary. But here's what he says. The nature of language is too complex for it to break down into explicit rules alone. And this is a paraphrase of an idea from page 60. And how the brain represents and processes language is not often what we think is in our heads. It's often too difficult to describe. Here is a little beautiful preview of what we are going to see in part two. If you are interested in learning more about this, we're going to dive into the orders of acquisition and some specific studies to help kind of guide us into what we need to know as language teachers and what kind of research is out there that really should be guiding what we teach and at what time. So stay tuned for part two.